You are listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, PJ team leader, jujitsu lover, meme enthusiast, and dad joke aficionado, Aaron Love. Do you guys like good gear, good quality gear that'll get you where you need to go? I know I do. Check out EberlyStock.com. They have an entire range of rucksacks and apparel that'll help you, whether it's military, law enforcement, or even hunting. Uh, I particularly like the F1 mainframe because I like to load that thing down and I can swap out different rucks and throw it onto the frame and then just attach it. Uh, I also have the Switchblade too, which is a nice little three-day ruck that'll get me going where I need to go. So... Great quality stuff, veteran owned. Uh, the owner is a prior Air Force A-10 pilot. Uh, great company. We really enjoy working with these folks because they, like I said, they produce some quality gear um, and it's definitely worth your time going to check them out. And if you do that and you decide to check out, use the promo code OR10. That is OR10, and it'll get you a discount on all of their gear. And they've got rucksacks, apparel, among a whole bunch of other things. So definitely go check them out. Eberlystock.com. Welcome back to the team room, everybody. It's Peaches and I. We're here to talk to you about some specific stuff, some really short answer, quick hit, direct to the point questions that you guys have. And you're always asking us about the three mission sets inside of AFSOC or specifically inside of ST. Those three mission sets, as you will remember, Precision strike, personal recovery, and today's topic, global access. What's global access, Aaron? What do PJs do inside of global access? What do global access teams do? Well, lucky you, Peaches and I are here to help. We're just going to get right into it, Peaches. So global access. If you had to give an overarching 30,000-foot view of what global access is, what is it? I, I would say access to certain spaces around the globe, but not limited to the globe probably cyberspace and space space <laughs> and space space we're space, going to space. mars people M-A-R-S. <laughs> absolutely so it's global access it's gaining entry um you know access and placement to those areas in order to support support current missions in order to support future missions and in order to occupy that space right it's just like a, there's a saying in cqc you only own the space which you occupy you have to occupy that space in order in order to own it so jumping right into it let's talk about lz's what are lz's okay so lz's are landing zones or often referred to as assault zones if you're going to kind of you know throw in the conglomerate of hlz's or or helo landing zones or drop zones dz stuff like that so you'll often hear it called assault zones but in this case we're talking about landing zones so that could be a a strip of land whether it's uh, you know pavement concrete dirt um ice believe it or not um you know, we'll, we will set up an airfield and we can land aircraft on there. Um, and there are certain dimensions and requirements that are required for each aircraft, you know. So like C-130s or 3,500 feet, and then you can go a lot longer. So, you, you know, like your A-10s and your fighters need a, a longer distance and stuff like that. And so there's also, so there's length and width considerations with that, as well as different kinds of markings. So depending on, you know, who you're working with, like if we're working with, uh, AFSOC aircraft, you know, we could do what's called an AMP-4, uh, which is a completely blacked out airfield, no no markings whatsoever. Um, generally, though, we are going to do what's called an AMP-3 or a box in one where there's minimal lightings. Uh, it pretty much gives you the beginning and the end of a runway, and it kind of gives you a touchdown box. Like, that's it. Or we could go full on, you know, Hartsville, Jackson, or Atlanta Airport, you know, where it's just 500 freaking lights. Uh, generally, right. we, we're not going to do that. Uh, those those that's, lights are that's a lot of lights. As a, as a guy, as a guy, as a guy on the team that has had to jump those panels before, yeah. that's a lot of lights. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, we we can give the the whole range of different LZs, but um, it depends on you know, like everything, and you pr- I'll probably say it several times during this, but it depends on what the mission is, what the threat is, what the environment is, and and kind of all those factors that determine you know what equipment we're carrying and what LZ type we're going to set up. 
Sure. And Air Force Special Tactics got it, to, you know, really did establish itself during GWAT and especially the combat control career field is everybody's like, you know, CCTs or JTACs, JTAC, JTAC, JTAC. Well, you know, that was that was kind of, you know, the last war. The next war that we're going to be fighting for is really finding these austere airfields or something that's not even an airfield. Just like you said, is this a big open strip of ground? Is it a frozen lake? Is it just open desert where we can make a, uh, a runway essentially or make an assault landing zone? That's a highly valuable skill, and it's actually combat control's primary duty. Um, JTAC is not the primary duty. It's airfield seizure. So um, moving on, let's talk about DZs, so drop zones. How do we establish drop zones, and then, you know, what are, what are some things that we think about there? So in terms of drop zones, I mean, they, you know, you've got to think about your getting things in there. So um, whether it's static line operations, military freefall operations, whether it's container delivery systems, so you, you're thinking, like, um, whether it's, you know, small containers, vehicles, um, strapping parachutes to them, throwing them out. Um, then you could do the kind of heavier where you're you're actually, you know, throwing out big vehicles, Humvees and stuff like that. That you know, Huge have resupply bundles. Yeah. yeah, huge. I mean, you you have what we call speed balls and stuff like that, which are just very tightly packed, you know, ammo, food, water, fuel, and that kind of stuff. And that literally any aircraft kind of, not, not any aircraft, but, not any you know, aircraft. yeah, you know. We're not, we're not, F-22s aren't freaking opening up the canopy and chucking it out the side or, ha- or have them built in, you know, and then just drop right. them. But, you know what I mean? Like, can helicopters just come out and just chuck them out? Like, that kind of thing, a speedball. So, there's a bunch of different um, methods of air delivery that we can utilize, and we have to set up kind of a drop zone for that. And we can do a hasty drop zone, and we could do pre-planned drop zones, just like, I'm going to roll right into HLZ since we're already talking about assault zones. So, you know. Yep. There are different um, dimension requirements um, for helicopter landing zones. Same with same with drop zones, but helicopter landing zones. You know, each, each aircraft is different size, has different rotor blades. You know, like a forty-seven is different than a fifty-three. Not too much different, but there are some differences. You know, CV CV twenty-two needs a whole lot of space, whereas a sixty or a little bird or a Huey doesn't need that much, right? So we right. can yeah. So for the same amount of space, maybe I can fit two in, two Hueys in, or two 60s in, but I can only fit maybe one CV-22, that kind of thing. Like, I'm not going to go into the numbers because I would probably just embarrass myself not knowing the numbers <laughs> right off the top of my head. Right, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd probably fare pretty well. But um, so those are the things that you got to think about. And then you also got to think about, you know, uh, the uneven terrain, uh, the, the incline of or the slope rather of mm-hmm. the terrain. You got to think about, are there tree stumps? Are there other obstacles? I remember going in to, uh, we were in Mosul and for whatever reason, like we just had no other option but to land on this soccer field. And I mean, it was just, we needed to get out of there and there was no other option. And you know, there's these goalposts and the <laughs> man, the one sixtieth, it incredible pilots, like, but uh, the old night stalkers. But I tell you what, like he he came down and flared and then let in a brownout, by the way, which if you're not familiar with the brownout, you guys, it's basically where all that dust kicks up and the pilots and the crew and nobody can see a thing. And they are going off of instinct and their instruments. But mm-hmm. he put that tail rotor a good six feet away from that uh, goalpost. Like it's terrifying. It was, um, yeah. Terrifying. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. But um, so that is why, you know, HLZ selection and HLZ, you know, dimensions and giving an HLZ brief and stuff like that is important. So those are all things that are kind of come very natural to us. And it's just it's inherent to what we do. Right. And there's there's other units out there like Army Pathfinders are notorious, um, notoriously good at finding spots for this. The, you know, the, the difference between, you know, arm, and, and by the way, combat control started from the Army Pathfinder program. That's where combat control has its history is, is Pathfinders. But we can do this on the fly. We can look around and go, hey, is this as big as a school bus? Can I get a helicopter in here? All right, let's go. Now this is our HLZ and, and we're going to support whatever operations it is. And people get wrapped around the axle about like, oh, well. What kind of stuff can you guys do there? Listen, if you don't have the ability to have aerial resupply, if you don't have the ability to have a follow on force come in, this is the reason that combat controllers um, are so good at austere airfield establishment and then control. 
right? It's another reason why combat controllers are so good at air traffic control. Cause you can, you can look around and you can go, okay, cool. Yeah. This spot is way big enough for like three or four aircraft. Well, if you have three or four aircraft in the stack, well, now you have an airfield. You just, you made Dallas love field in the middle of nowhere. And now you got to be that controller and you gotta, you gotta get those planes in there. So, um, it, I'm going to see if we can mention one more airport. Maybe we can get Charlotte know, in yeah. there. <laughs> hey, sure. <laughs> Something like I will that. say, I will say Charlotte's lounge, the uh, Centurion lounge in Charlotte, magnifique. Every time I see, every time I see a layover in Charlotte, I'm like, ooh, boo, boo. I'll see you at that <laughs> lounge, my bro. Not, um, not to discount the USO. Charlotte USO is is pretty on point. So I'm shout sorry, out to you guys. Shout out to the USO. I'm sure we'll we'll tag you in this one. I'm sure you guys will give us a retweet or whatever. Um, so let's talk about FARP, and this is a forward arming, uh, forward air and arming refueling point. I don't know something like that. Yeah. FARP. What, what, what's a FARP? What do we do? Yeah, you're, you're good. So so FARP <laughs> kind of falls into those those uh, that whole assault zone thing as well, right? But why? So it's air refueling, right? So we're going to refuel aircraft, um, whether that is from a, a fuel bladder that we have on site, or maybe we're going to do a wet wing where, you know, we have a C-130 that's going to be refueling helicopters or something like that um, is, is kind of your your typical FARP site. Uh, and we can also rearm aircraft. And it's not necessarily like me rearming. We manage the right. FARP. We set it up. We do the survey for it and stuff like that and go, hey, this is a good spot to set up a FARP. And we'll we'll manage it as part of the airfield functions. But um, like, we're, I'm not plugging the hose in. Um, I'm not putting <laughs> right. the bomb yeah, or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's I, a whole other thing. To see you with a, just a missile, like trying to put it on. <laughs> just a hellfire on my back, yeah. trying to, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I need a couple step ladders for that, I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, it's funny, though, that we're talking about that because then we can start talking about the whole multi-capable airman thing, which is a whole other monster that they're talking about. So, like, if we want to integrate that into um, like, since we're talking, since I brought it up, the multi-capable airmen, like that is the whole kind of point. So what they're looking at doing is maybe a, a maintainer who is trained in multi-capable stuff who, you know, works on, we'll just call it the avionics of a C-130 or something like that, um, can also refuel other aircraft, refuel itself, uh, learn how to arm other aircraft like that's that whole multi-capable thing but why does this matter what like why does a farp why is a farp important you know outside of afghanistan or iraq or, or africa right why why is it important to be able to forward arm well you know uh comanche smith the socom senior enlisted leader brought it up during our pod when we had him on um and he's got great talking points on it so if you if you do look into like the the belt and road initiative or um the spratly islands like just giving that for an example like those are important like those are a bunch of islands you know we we set up landing zones on beaches as well i i was surprised too when i first heard that but we do that um if it meets the requirements so you know whether it's places in africa whether it's uh, other remote places, or whether it's it could be stateside too. If we're talking about you know a humanitarian disaster, which I know that we're going to cover later on, but like there are needs to refuel aircraft. These helicopters we have, they can fly a long way, but they can't fly as far as you think they can. So they either need to air refuel from you know air you know from C one thirties that are refueling them in the air, or they need a spot you know a midpoint to land at, stage out of refuel. Go fly to what they need to do to go do and then come back, refuel and keep doing that. So they need a staging point, And that's the whole point of doing a fart. Yep. And I, and I think people just completely are blind to the fact that that's like that's what ST does. And people are like, well, you know, how you know, well, what does a, you know, what, what does an SR guy do in here? And like, what does a PJ do? Well, we get after the mission. If we need to go move rocks, if we need to go help you figure out where the best spot to control from your ATC is. If, if I need is, and you know, I, I took this to heart because my, my learning curve was huge because although I'm a PJ, I was expected to be, you know, my commander looked right at me and was like, listen, Aaron, I know you've got personnel recovery. Well, he said, <laughs> I, I almost made a joke, but I didn't want to put words in his mouth. <laughs> I suck it. I'm a shitty PJ too. And he knows that. Um, but he was like, listen, you got personnel recovery. 
handled to the level that you're going to have it, let's say that. But you also need to be just as good at global access. And I distinctly remember an FMP where he was like, hey, why didn't you keep everybody away from this controller? He only needs to be focusing on one thing and it's talking to aircraft and whatever else. And I just looked at, at him straight up and I was like, hey, my bad, sir. I failed in this one because I just didn't know. Yeah. Um, but but it was my job. And, you know, me as a, as a pararescueman, like I was begging for a mass casualty at one point. I'm just like, oh, my goodness, I, like, give me something that I can knock out of the park on. Give me a patient to treat, you know, but people aren't aware. Like we work in small teams and all of the AFSCs, all of the one Zulus work in concert to make these things happen, to provide an area for that aircraft away from the actual problem set to land, refit, rekit, and then go back without having to go all the way back to base or without having to do aerial refueling, which, by the way, are <laughs> But all, but all, but you know, you brought it up. It all of this ties, you know, everything that we've covered so far, all ties into that, that whole ACE concept, the agile mm -hmm. combat employment, like all of it. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, so there's not a part like, and we start thinking about like, oh, that's a soft mission, or that's a conventional mission, or that's air combat command mission. Like, hey, man, it's an air force mission. It's an it's a DOD mission that we've got to get after. It's not, hey, this is, you know, everybody has their expertise, but the whole point of it is that everybody has their part and everybody is is a cog in that wheel or a cog in that machine or whatever you want to call it that makes everything work. Yeah, and we were doing stuff, you know, some of our, some of our missions before is maybe sometimes an embassy goes, hey, we're in a really dangerous area. We need to figure out how we're going to get people out of this area if we get overrun, like in Benghazi. Guess what? There was an airstrip that was right outside of that place that had to be surveyed. It had to be, we had to figure out exactly how many people we could evacuate from that airfield. And that's a big part of it too. Like there's a, you know, the department of state mission and all these other things. So um, it's a really interesting part of the, part of the mission set that I think people kind of, it's, listen, it's, it's sexy to drop a big bomb on stuff and blow it up. Yeah, I, it just is like, I, I'm, I'll tell the story about the very first time that I was ever, I had a um, RY uh his uh his name is brad he took me out I, I was actually the pj that was attached we only had two at the time that was on the airfield seizure team and it was highly unpopular by the way because it was 2008 2009 time frame and everybody just wanted to go to iraq and afghanistan and drop bombs. so but he took me out i was at cannon and he took me out um and was like benevolent enough to take the pjs out on the range and you know we got to drop c-130 or ac-130 and you know drop live bombs out on the training range out there i was like okay, I love being a PJ. I totally get the control. <laughs> I, I've got it. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you like from, you know, and you look forward and this is, you know, now I, I guess 12 or 13 years later, and I am actually in, in charge on the NCOIC or the SEL of a, of a global access team. And I, I'll tell you, it was, it was just as rewarding. It wasn't as loud. It wasn't as cool as watching, you know, a huge explosion goes off, going off or hearing an eight, you know, an A 10 roll in and, and destroying stuff like everybody loves the Burt, but it was, it was still pretty cool, you know? So, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that it's not just like, we talk about global access being a primarily controller mission, but it's not though, because PJs, SR, TACPs play a part. Like there is a precision strike aspect of global access, which the controllers and the TACPs take care of. There is a reconnaissance aspect of, global access that SR takes care of, right? There is a medical aspect and not just that, not just medical, like we task the PJs to do airfield stuff too. Kind of like how if, if we're doing a mass cash scenario, I'm not just going to, if I don't have aircraft, I'm not just going to sit there like waiting for aircraft. You're going to put me to work with my yeah. limited medical training, right? Mm -hmm. But you're still going to, hey, plug that hole, put a tourniquet on that dude, do the, you know, just like on an airfield or a farm site or something like that, I'm going to go, Aaron, I need you to go over there and whatever it is. Like, yeah. So they, everybody plays a role in that. Yeah. And uh, since you, you transitioned so good, I, I'm mad that Trent isn't here to see these transitions so that he can, he can make his segue game better because it's terrible. I just love how <laughs> damn it, he has like a movie quote or some sort of weird quote that he says, and then he just moves on. So it's great. But, um, you know, speaking about those medical capabilities and how the PJs really fit inside of this is, is something called MedCap. And that is a medical civil affairs program is actually what that stands for. I know that acronym. Um, talk to me about a little bit of, of MedCap, and we'll start with the assessment of those medical uh, capabilities. Uh, you want you want me to cover it? Okay, yeah, I was actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
that's good. No, I'll, I'll okay, well, I mean, I, I, I can tell you what I think from my perspective, good. and then you can tell me how wrong I am. Um, okay. So it kind of goes back to that conversation that we've had previously about, you know, what's the difference between a PJ and an 18 Delta? Like, I look at PJs as being trauma experts, um, kind of in the... In the, definitely stepping into the pharmaceutical rain, uh, realm as, as well, but primarily high angle rescue, trauma, swift water rescue, like that yeah, person. Mass um, yeah. Right, mass casualty. Whereas your 18 deltas are cl- more clinically based. Like they are, they can handle trauma. I'm not de- denigrating 18 deltas, but they can handle they're trauma. Great. But but their game is is 100 clinical in the pharmaceutical realm. Um, so. You know, typically you're going to see 18 deltas doing mad cap, uh, med caps out and, you know, while they're doing key leader engagements at villages and stuff like that, doing dental work. But you guys have also stepped into that game. And that's an important aspect of global access because now as we are entering a, a village or an area that Americans haven't been in a while or, you know, we're coming in there, we're, we're bringing supplies, we're bringing medical capabilities. Um, and now the PJs get to work. How, how yeah, well did I cover that? <laughs> Man, you crushed it. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Um, yeah, but you, you hit it dead on, right? So nobody says no to medicine. And when we start talking about what do we need, we need placement and access. So I've done a couple of med caps. You know, the most notable one that I've done was, you know, in, uh, in the Horn of Africa, we drove a little bit uh, west and, you know, two or three hours west. And we went to a small village and we went there and we were no kidding. And by the way, med caps are not only... Um, done on the green gray side of the house, but they're done on the army um, civil affairs side of the house too. That's actually the number number one um, entity that does like a lot of the med caps is, is civil affairs. And we tagged in with them. We we're like, hey, we think we can get after this. And it opened up my my mind. It was the first one I went on, which is probably why you know it's so fresh for me. But you know, they were like, hey, we're we're there to provide medicine. There's not a lot that you can do for this village. Like some of them need follow on care. Like I, I tell this story all the time, but no kidding, a guy uh, a, a a gentleman walked in, he was in his seventies or eighties. He'd been tuberculosis positive for about 40 years of his life. We hook him up to the monitor because there are things that you can do like, Hey, you know, you, they feel like, you know, it's, it's a way to, you know, uh, interact with them and, and you're having conversations with them, which is the biggest part of this thing, right? We want to win hearts and minds, but really the, the phrase is you want to win that human terrain. The next time something happens and we come back to that village, we want them to go, Oh, you're the one that, that, gave me this medicine. You're the one that gave me this medical care. But I distinctly remember an 18 Delta, a civil affairs medic and I were looking at this monitor and everything that we've ever learned told us that this rhythm on the monitor should have killed this guy. Like he was in a like a sustained, non-sustainable rhythm. And we were just dumbfounded. We left him on the monitor for like 15 minutes. And we're just like, you know, is this guy having an event? And the 18 Delta like kind of looked at me. He's like, hey, bro, this guy walked 10 miles with no water in the African heat to come see us. And he's going to walk home. Like, do you think that we could? He's like, we might kill him by treating him for what we see on this. So we're just like, OK, cool. Well, here's a multivitamin. I hope you have a good day. That guy needs to be studied. We need to bring him back to the U.S. Yeah. and study him. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know what, the whole time and and to wrap this into like, how does it support agile combat employment? And how does it support the actual mission that we're getting after that whole time? You know what we were asking him? Hey, does anybody come into your village and and take your supplies? Are there, are there any, anybody here from ISIL? Are there anybody here that's walking around that, that, uh, that you don't like, where's the nearest hospital? If we weren't here, where would you go to get medical care? Um, that's valuable information. And all of that is, and all of that is aggregated and then it's put into a system. Because that does support agile combat employment. You need to know where those medical facilities are. And PJs are uniquely qualified to gain access to that medical infrastructure. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Bam. Bam. Um, Bam. And then the, uh, the other one here is like we're, we're kind of, you know, talking about foreign internal defense. Right. So, um, you know, aviation, foreign internal defense. So there's a difference between foreign internal defense and security force assistance. We're talking about foreign internal defense. Easiest way to think about it is security force assistance is conventional. Foreign internal defense is a special operations um, sort of mission set here. So there's a lot of times, and we did this with our partner forces, and and we continue to do so. We teach them everything we can about TCCC, right? Fix your own problems. Make sure that you can protect yourself 
in an event. We worked really, really closely with some of our mission partners that we've had this last deployment. And the biggest win that we ever got, and it sounds weird, but they took 25 casualties in a complex IED attack near the Malian border. They didn't call us. That was a huge win for us because they were able to protect themselves. They were able to treat their own casualties. And with the skills that we gave that partner force, they were able to establish an HLZ. They were able to call those aircraft and use correct phraseology and get it in there safely and then evacuate those to a higher level of care to a place that we were like, listen, if you have these injuries, they need to go to this hospital. And if they have these injuries, they have to go to this hospital. And they crushed it. They did it with minimal support from the American. And that's the point. Mm -hmm. We want them. We want them to be able to hold their own against an opposing force long enough for us to get there. Think of it like, guys, the cavalry's coming. We just need you to be able to hold your ground until we get there and fix your own problems. And that's we felt really good. We had a really high sense of mission accomplishment from that from that event. Yeah, I mean, what do people like us? What do we want to do? We want to be the ones hacking the mission, but that doesn't that doesn't meet the intent of where we need to go and progress as a nation. Mm-hmm. I mean, because the, the globe is too big for us to be everywhere. And we're also not allowed to be everywhere as, as well. Exactly. Because you can't, just, you can't just place yourself into a sovereign nation, right? Right. You, you know, mm-hmm. so there's got to be things going on. You have to be invited and all, all those other political aspects and authorities mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But, um, like, the goal is to help people to be self-sustainable. Right. And I heard it described really, really well at the Moab that I was I was just uh, I, I was just at. It was described in another sense, but it completely applies here. We need to be in more places. Uh, we need to be in more than one place at, at one time. We yep. need to find ways to operate. And the way that you do that is that you have a partner force that's trained that operates just like you. That's how you can be in more than one place at one time. So um, enough on that. I think, man, you, I'm just so happy you crushed it. You made my, made my little <laughs> internal medical heart happy. <laughs> Um, let's talk about surveys. We've got them on here. You know, what, what sort of things that, that you start? I think we covered it pretty well, but anything you want to hit on surveys just because we had it in here? Um, no, I mean, I mean, admittedly, there's a there's an aspect of surveys that we just can't talk about right now because, it, you know, one, right. we get our clearances taken away, two, is we, we <laughs> yeah. bust, we'd bust all kind of stuff. So I don't want to address it like it's it's not that it's not avoidance of just um, mm-hmm. being a. Uh, careful of OPSEC. So, you know, obviously when you talk about surveys, though, we're talking about assault zones, um, medical capability surveys, um, and, 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 humans. And, and humans, and humans, and which goes into the kind of that key leader engagement. Like, you know, obviously I want to, or whoever that ground force commander wants to establish a good relationship with the elders or with the village leaders or the, the, whatever town you're in, those kind of leaders in the community, like, that's not nefarious activity. Like that is genuine. We want to go in there, set up a good relationship because we help them, they help us. And it goes right back into that foreign internal defense, you know, uh, mission set. So um, I think we're good with the survey thing. The The other thing that we were going to roll into though is Hatter, the human humanitarian assistance disaster relief thing, which um, special tactics has played a huge part in um, with all things, you know, from Katrina to Ivan to um, Maria. I mean, it just keep keep going, right? The Haiti earthquakes, um, the yeah. Fukushima nuclear resa- uh, disaster, the 320, 320th was huge there. They went in and they, I believe the 320th was the very first military unit that established an airfield to start evacuating people and searching when the Fukushima nuclear reactor went down. Yeah, I mean, it, and it... it doesn't in there the the earthquake in Pakistan? Uh, shoot, I guess it's probably been about eleven or twelve years ago now. But like mm-hmm. it, it always happens. Um, and then you've got you know guys like the old the old SAR pup, you know that yeah. the guard yeah, unit exactly. that are what up, yeah, that are you know going and and I don't know just because I'm not on social media at the moment, right? But hurricanes and and I know that there was uh, some really bad tornadoes in Tennessee, Kentucky. Oh, I- I misspoke. I, I meant the tornadoes in yeah. Kentucky. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, Cali was out there for that, looking for people. And it, it's weird where these things pop up too. I had a really close friend of mine that's uh, he was a PJ. I went through almost my whole pipeline with him. Turned out to you know changed over. He went to the dark side. He's a crow in Alaska now. 
he responded to an avalanche in Afghanistan. So that was a tr- that was a true Hatter mission that we responded to. It just happened to be in in Afghanistan where this avalanche wiped out this entire section of highway and they had to respond to it. And, uh, you know, we, we have a full spectrum response on the ST side of the house. And by the way, this is completely Air Force centric when you're when you're weighing like and again, <clears throat> it's not comparison, but it's important to understand what the different mission sets are. This is almost completely inherent to Air Force Special Operations is the Hatter mission set. Like if you want to have the ability to respond to a hurricane, we almost got alerted. There was a a lot of flooding that happened in the way Northwest of Washington. And we were getting phone calls like, hey, we might need you guys for search and rescue and for recovery. And we're like, yeah, we do that. You know, that's a a very small Hatter. Um, It's not as big as say the Haiti earthquakes, but there are very famous, uh, very famous photos of at the time, Master Sergeant Keith O'Grady and his team from the 2-3 STS rolling through the streets of Haiti in order to open that airfield up. And they mm-hmm. did great things out there. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and there's there are all aspects of it in terms of global access, personnel recovery. And you're not really doing precision strike during a, a, a Hatter event. But, you know, so right. we're, we're looking at, you know, opening up airfields, um, creating <clears throat> airfields. You know, I-10 out there, you know, north of, uh, not north of, but, it you know, it goes through, basically the southern U.S., but, you know, after um, Hurricane Katrina and stuff like that, you know, I-10, great sections of road to create an LZ to bring in C-130s. There's airdrops, so part of that drop zone, bringing in helicopters, both Army um, and the Air Force helicopters, you know, so bringing in supplies, getting people out, uh, refueling, right? So all of those things that we talked about earlier, bringing in medical supplies. So, um, and then for the PJ aspect of it, you know, uh, confined space, you know, when buildings collapse or the flooding, you know, so we can bring in the wing boats. We can, we can help with that. If we need to die for people, we will. It's not generally what we want to do though. in that kind of event, right. uh, but, it, let me, let me tell you from, from, <laughs> from being a qualified blackwater diver, you know, dry suit, man, I've, the, the coldest I've ever been has been in the water underneath. And I mean, it is, it is obvious. First of all, terrifying. Yeah. So, you know, be, being in completely black water doing search dives, we had a great dive master at the 58. And he used to, no kidding, he'd be like, okay, we're going to search this area. And he would have, you'd be blacked out and he would have a couple carabiners and he, he would have, at times he would have like a really expensive watch. And he just, he'd be like, turn around, throw it in. He'd be like, all right. Go find it. it. Yeah. I've heard heard the story about that $10,000 watch. He just chucks into the water. He's like, go find it. And people find it every single time because his TTPs are are proven. But, I, you know, it's just (laughs) – but, I mean, there's there's so many aspects. And it's just like a hatter, like a hatter event, whether it's a hurricane, earthquake, or whatever. You don't – tornado. You don't know what you're stepping into. You have an idea because of what happened in the past, but you don't know what you're going to need. So the PJs are going to go do mass casualty, um, you know, if it's required. They're going to go do search and rescue with, you know, Cali and SARPA if it's required. Confined space, swift water rescue, that kind of stuff. The controllers and SR are going to be focusing on setting up airfields. They'll also ride hoist down too if needed, but generally the PJs are only going to be ones doing that. But it's all working together, all integrating air assets, ground assets, um, any kind of naval or boat asset assets if required, or you know if that scenario um, involves it, and then getting after the humanitarian and helping people out. And the bottom line is when people ask us, well, what, what do PJs do on a, on a, on a Hatter mission that you did? Like if you look at the Haiti earthquake and you're just bringing plane after plane after plane. And just like you said earlier, we're not just standing there twiddling our thumbs waiting for something to happen. We're finding work. That's what yeah. you do. Shoot, move, shoot, move, communicate, lead. And then you help get after the mission, whatever that mission looks like. And that's what the guys uh, did in uh, Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria, I think is what it was. Like PJs put in work. They were treating people. They were seeing people that were hurt, you know maybe it was some cuts and bruises. Maybe it was some, you know, people that didn't have their medication because they were trapped and they couldn't get access to it. So they helped provide medication to people like, you know, yep. it could be anything. Yep. Absolutely. I think that gets to like, we get, we got through a lot of stuff there, you know, yeah. we got at the bottom, the bottom line is that global access extends our legs and it allows us to operate inside environments that we didn't have before. And, and we did that through placement and access. What do you got on that one? I mean, that's that's the end goal, right? Whatever the nation needs us to do, whatever SOCOM needs to do, the Air Force will do it, whether it's a 
a contingency operation downrange or whether it's on the homeland or even in U.S. territories, like we're here to help. Um, it, I mean, that's really what it's it's about. So, like you said, place and access. Um, it, of course, it doesn't sound as sexy, if you will, as you know, precision strike blowing things up because that's what we've been doing for the last twenty years. That's the reality of it. But that mission set is also not going away. Um, for TACPs, and it's not going away for combat controllers either. And it's important for people to remember that JTAC or the Joint Terminal Attack Controller is a qualification. Um, so that will remain. That's not going away. But global access plays an integral part in ensuring that America is successful across the globe. Absolutely. And it's the AFSOC we need, not the AFSOC we have. And it's anytime, anywhere, and we mean that. Whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a tornado, whether it's a kinetic operation, we're task organized specifically to get after these mission sets, right? Global access, strike, and recovery. We hit global access today. We're going to hit strike. We're going to hit recovery. We're going to talk about these things so you guys have all the information you need. So Peaches, another banger. Everybody go to the page, like, subscribe, follow, comment, put us out there. I saw a comment on YouTube. was like, how do you guys only have 17K followers? <laughs> I don't know. Can you guys send this stuff out a little bit more? I don't know. How, to, I don't yeah, know how, how, how about share it a little bit? I don't know, I guess, you know. I'm a bad operator as it is. Like, I don't know how to do social media either. Guys, can I get some help? Uh, go over to onesready.com. We have all the show notes. We have all this stuff there. And, and again, we're going to try to put this stuff out as much as possible, like these quick hitter little episodes. So let us know if you're digging it. Hit the shop up and get some merch. Uh, it's past Christmas now when this is going to be out. But hey, we've always got new stuff for you if you want to make sure that you fly that flag and, and earn your earn each breath and I just can't wait till I see one in the wild. I haven't I haven't seen anybody in a One's Ready t-shirt yet, but I'm waiting on the day. It's going to be awesome. So. <laughs> did, I, did I tell you about a guy that, oh, man, I'll have to tell you afterwards, but I had a guy come up to me in Best Buy. It was awesome. <laughs> no, well, he, he, so we'll leave this on there. Now we're now we're just talking. So we, uh, I, I got a call from a friend. Uh, you know, she went on. So a lifelong friend of mine, I've known her literally, like I was, you know, we went to high school together. I, I met her when I was. 14 or 15 we went through our entire high school together and then we both found our way to the air force she was a security forces squadron commander and then she got out she went on to a different life but she lives in san antonio short story she was like hey love the project i got a shirt she sent me a picture of a shirt no kidding 20 minutes later she was like i walked in heb and in, in up around stone oak in san antonio because that's that's where she lives and she was like i walked in and somebody literally stopped me was like is that a one's ready shirt and she was like yeah i'm friends with aaron and she, he was like no kidding i know aaron and i was like <laughs> all right cool man thanks for the support but let that be a lesson to you the old the tangent the peaches and i just went on wear that shirt fly the flag go find it on one's ready.com follow us on youtube follow us on instagram hey everybody thanks for coming out we'll see you next time later